The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit of the joints and the marrow, and is a critic of thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourselves approved unto God, a workman that does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. All right, once again, this is your opportunity as a believer to make the usual preparation, as is our custom at Maranatha Church, to remind you that one of the things working against us in Bible class is to sit here any amount of time out of fellowship. Whatever problems and issues and situations in your life, the Bible tells us to lay aside, and you do that with 1 John 1, 9, lay aside the old self and put on the new, and you're filled with the Holy Spirit, and you're ready to go. Let us pray. Father, we thank you that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. We thank you that our faith in Jesus Christ has overcome the doom of the world. We thank you that you continue to provide for us divine viewpoint so that as believers, we can lay hold of those things that you have for those who take you seriously. Bless this Bible class to that end in Christ's name. Amen. A couple little news items to illustrate as if you needed it. For those of you who've been here, that uh, this country has lost its marbles. Illinois politicians in the capital city of the state of Illinois, Springfield, installed a baby Bahomet. Bahomet is the statue of Satan, the, god, the, the goat god, if you've seen it. There's a great big one in Detroit. But this was a baby. As the Savior, alongside a traditional navy, uh, nativity scene. Unreal. Actually promoting Satan at Christmas time <laughs> for all who visited the uh, courthouse, whatever building in Springfield. Not a problem, huh? And I saw the picture of it with hooded people, with, of course, in black outfits with hoods and giving, and giving the satanic salute. Somebody said, Google all the famous people that uh, have been caught on camera doing the satanic salute. Well, I'm not going to because it's... The last one is NASA, I added this, the fake space industry has hired a Catholic priest to begin to prepare mankind to accept aliens once they appear. This was found in Israel 365 News. Wow. Well, <clears throat> the statement about the United States found in uh, Revelation 18, before we proceed. After the rapture, an angel will come down out of heaven. Now, there will be a visitor. He has great authority, and the earth was illumined with his glory, Revelation 18, 1. And he cried out with a mighty voice. America's still here. We're gone. The rapture's occurred. He cries out with a voice. Now, this voice is so, so much that the whole world can hear it. I don't know how angels do this, but they, they've, got, they've got the wherewithal to do it. He cries out with a mighty voice saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place of demons, a prison of every unclean spirit. You know, there's rampant demon activity in the United States and a prison of every unclean and hateful bird. The bird analogy is to humans, dirty birds. And then he goes on to make this, read the rest of it. So I've, I've told you, Revelation 18 is devoted to the United States, and the order they come in, 17 is another entity that is going to be taken down in the tribulation, and God's going to use the Antichrist to take it down. And that's the Catholic Church in Europe. He's going to plunder it. 
He's going to absolutely ravage it. That includes uh, the Vatican and all the big cathedrals because they've got all kinds of wealth in these things. Lots of wealth. And underground uh, catacombs and stuff, they've, got, they've stored up all kinds of wealth through the centuries. Even, a, even in impoverished countries like in Latin America, the Catholic Church has got all these the jewels and gold crosses that could be melted down. And these poor people come and throw their money in this little trough and support this, this evil. It's going down too. God has a case against it. All right, back to Romans 8. I want to touch on these two verses we covered in the second session Sunday because it struck me because of one word in the verse. Well, the whole verse, you have to have the whole thing. But the one word jumps out. So then, brethren, we're under obligation, not to the STA, the flesh, to live according to the flesh. And if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. That's the sin unto death. The sin unto death is the end. Okay, take a believer, once saved, always saved. Take a believer who dies not in the directive will of God, advancing spiritually when the end comes, and they, they die the sin unto death. They die the sin unto death. Put another way, they die without honor. Oh, they're graced out, they go to heaven, just like anyone else. So they don't have, and they don't, they don't enjoy another aspect of grace that is reserved for those who are glorifying God when the time comes for them to go home. Called dying grace. He gives special grace. God gives special grace for every test and every situation. They can die with plus H and inner peace. That's, that's a reward for the obedient believer. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, putting, he, he words it here with the deeds of the body because sin is manifested through our physical being, through our thinking, through our speech, and through our overt actions. We produce sin. And if we are putting to death these things, that means we are either faithfully hitting the rebound button and or we are resisting the urge to commit a particular sin. There are a tremendous amount of sins related to speech. I'll give you one, flattery. God hates a flattering tongue. You can compliment somebody, that's a nice outfit. But if the motivation is to flatter, then that's the sin of the tongue. Job said he avoided that like a plague. It's in the book of Job somewhere, that particular sin. So there's a lot of sins of the tongue, speech. That's why the prayer, God put a guard on my mouth and hear things and don't immediately react with something that may not be appropriate. Silly talk. It's in the Bible. And all the other things, lying, on and on and on, gossip, maligning. Oh, did you hear? We're not talking about reporting that a believer has a test. That's not gossiping about them. But to try to cast them in a bad light. Now, again, if they are doing something manifestly out of line, you have to be careful, but this believer is doing this. This is wrong and out of line. That's okay, within a reason. Just to illustrate. If you're putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So what are we under obligation to? We're under obligation to, you say God, yes, but particularly the third person of the Godhead. He's the one that revealed the gospel to you. 
He's the one that regenerated you when you opted to believe in Christ and gave you eternal life and imputed plus R to you in a human spirit. He's the one who indwells you and he seals you, keeps you saved for the, for the day of redemption of, of the body. And he will be involved in the resurrection of your body. And he's the one who helps you with prayer. He's the one who takes your prayer and makes it, even if it's not complete and articulate like you would, uh, whatever, the, you can do a perfect prayer. But Father, help me with this project I'm working on. Bless me today on my job. Help me to do it as unto you. I mean, things like that. But he takes our prayers and makes them perfect. And they are presented to the intercessor, Jesus Christ, who in turn puts them before the Father. So he does that for us. And right now, he's making truth clear to us. So we're under obligation to him. We are, we are under no obligation to the STA in any way at any time. Our obligation is to follow God and his plan. It isn't to make somebody happy. That'll drive you nuts. You're not here to make people happy. You're here to glorify God. If they like it, they like it. If they don't, too bad. We're under obligation. We have been given this so great salvation and all the attendant potential blessings connected therewith that we ought to glorify God and not grieve and quench God the Holy Spirit. That's our obligation. It includes all the imperatives of Scripture. I got to be in Bible class. I got to get there. I got to get there. Get up. Oh, I don't feel good. Oh, it's a little late. You come here 10 minutes late. We don't care. Sit down in the foyer if you want to. Make it, a, make it a priority. Make it at least an equal priority to you getting to your job location on time and ready to do your job. All right, moving on. Confirmation of sonship. We are sons of God, children of God. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God. For all who are being led, present active indicative of the verb to lead something, ago, being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For... You have not received a spirit of slavery, leading to fear again, for you have not received a spirit, pneuma in the singular, of slavery, dulia, the noun, means slavery, enslavement, again, to fear, the preposition with the noun phobos, the Greek for fear. We have our word phobia but you have received a spirit of adoption. But you have received a spirit of adoption. The Greek noun for adoption is based on the noun for son, weothesia, adoption. And I'll explain why our relationship to God is parallel to the practice of adopting a child. That's pretty simple. When you were born into the world, you were not a child of God. But when you believed in Christ, you're an adopted son of, or child of God. Different, different thing, and, but it's, you're still as much a full-blown child. A spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The enduring term to address the first person of the Godhead and this would be cry out, would be in times of, of, of big time testing, present indicative, kradzo, a child, typically, under some duress, 
cries out to the parent for help. Cry out, and then Abba is a, is a, is a loan word from the language that Jesus and the disciples and the others around him spoke. They didn't speak Greek, they didn't speak ancient Hebrew, they spoke the language, the new language, the sister language that Israel got as a result of their 70 years in Babylonian captivity. They went in speaking traditional Hebrew and they came back 70 years later speaking Aramaic. It's also a Semitic language. And in the Semitic language of Aramaic, our word Papa or Daddy comes off as Abba. Abba, Father. Father is the more reserved term for the male parent. The Spirit himself, with the article, the Spirit himself testifies, present active indicative, sum martyreo. This means to bear witness to something. With our spirit, there's your human spirit again, with our spirit, that we are children of God. Instead of saying sons, he uses the word children, it is the word technon. We have technology, various things off of technon. Technon refers to a child in training, being brought up and trained in the different things so that they can advance on down the line uh, as a regular human being. And if children, heirs also. Let's take it up another. We have a new parent. We have a heavenly parent, our Abba Father. And as children, we are heirs. Children typically inherit from parents when they pass by the scene. That's, that's standard. Chironomus means an heir heirs of God and fellow heirs heirs of God and fellow heirs the word heirs occurs twice heirs also heirs of God and then we have the sug kleronomos that means joint heirs with Christ but here's the thing you got to be willing to do if you're going to inherit beyond the basic blessings of the afterlife, which include, of course, a resurrection body, just like Christ, and being in the millennium, that first phase of the kingdom of God, being living in the new Jerusalem in the, in the, uh, uh, on the new earth, that's basic. If all you do believe in Christ, that's your basic package. There's nothing to sneeze at. It's wonderful. It's magnificent. But if we, if indeed we suffer with him so that we also might be glorified with him. All right. We, we introduced the word, uh, if indeed we suffer with. You know, heirs with, now we have suffer with. Present active indicative, sum pasco, to suffer with someone in something. We will be glorified with him. The word to share another's glory. To share another's glory only occurs here in the Greek. It's an aorist passive subjunctive. We, become, we receive the action of the verb passive. Subjunctive is potential for the full glorification factor. It is soon doxa. Soon, dox adzomai. One, being led by the Spirit of God is proof positive that a person is a son of God. It is external evidence. If you're being led by the Spirit of God, both here now, learning doctrine, led by the Spirit of God to make applications of doctrine, if you're led by the Spirit of God, this is proof positive that, they, that the individual is a, is, a, is a son of God, a child of God. Unbelievers do not have the Holy Spirit, point two, and are confined to the rulership of their sin natures. You see it all over the place with its attendant constant 
blatherings of human viewpoint, all the usual STA stuff. I don't care how successful they are, how educated they are, how attractive they are. Big deal. Doesn't cut any ice with God. None. Because they are ruled by their sin nature and it is surfacing in all kinds of little ways. They not be, might be some super corrupt person, but you see it. You hear it in what they say and how they relate to things. They like to boast, brag about things as per, give, as per giving God credit for something. Oh no, forget that one. They may try to do it discreetly, not obnoxiously, but they do. They like to tell what they've done and what they've accomplished and all the rest of it. There is no sanctification of it with God blessed me, helped me, got me through this uh, as I was a growing believer. No. They like to boast where they've been, what they have, who they've met. They like to name drop. It's all vanity. It's all emptiness. And God is not impressed with any of it. That's the whole thing of pushing these celebrities in our face. Where's yesterday's celebrities? Where's a Marilyn Monroe? Where's she now? for all of her fame and everything in her life. And it comes down to a death that people debate as whether it was an overdose or she got herself murdered. Oh, that'll come out in the, in the wash too. All believers in Christ have been led by the Holy Spirit at least one time. When the Holy Spirit was active when they were hearing the gospel, presented to them, and they accepted it, that, that's being led by the Spirit. The convicting ministry, or I also call it the convincing ministry in John 16. And one of two reactions. The person believes, or they don't. And if they don't, you know what they're calling the Holy Spirit? A liar. Those who exercise saving faith are led by the Spirit as per the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit laid down in John 16, 8 and following. After Jesus says, look, I'm not, something the disciples didn't want to hear. He told his disciples, I've got to go away. I've got to go to the next phase of my history. And it isn't staying here indefinitely on this earth. I've got to go away. I've got to go to the Father. The plan calls for me to go to the Father. But I'm not going to leave you here without a helper. He's also called a comforter, but he's a helper. And he's a very good one. The difference is, unlike me, you can't see him. But he's every bit as real. And of course, the sending of the helper occurred on the day of Pentecost at the onset of our dispensation. But if I go, I'll send him to you. There, there's your chain of command again. If you send someone, you're an authority over them to send them at some level. I got, I, I got an assignment for you, so I send you. Then I would have authority to send you to do something. As a father would say to his son, take the trash can out to the curb. That's an authority function. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. What sin is he going to convict them of? Sins in general? No, he, he, he defines it. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Negative volition or failure to believe in Christ is a sin. In fact, it's the very worst sin of all the sins you could even imagine. 
It is the unpardonable sin. If perpetuated through a lifetime, now yeah, a person can initially hear the gospel and blow it off, but later believe like Paul did. Yeah. But if they persist in rejection of the gospel message, they are guilty of the unpardonable sin, and the punishment for the unpardonable sin is life or eternity in the lake of fire, body and soul, with no way out, no hope, no nothing, just eternal, miserable suffering. Oh, you got your memories, but they won't give, won't give them any happiness. You had three homes. You had one in Nichols Hills. You had one in Massachusetts. And you had one in California. And you're rich because your dad was in the oil and gas business in Oklahoma and made a fortune. I heard this just the other day. And he was the owner as well of Hotel California. <laughs> He's dead now. And his daughter got all the wealth. She never had to do anything but luxuriate in her wealth. No pleasant memories for the unbeliever after he or she dies. Nothing but eternal misery. You can't kill yourself. You can't get out of there. The rich man in hell. Remember that story? You had all the good things. Remember, buddy? You had all the good things. And this Lazarus, a fellow Jew, who was a bum and reduced to, you knew him, reduced to rummaging through your garbage cans to survive had sores on his body, wasn't healthy, but he was a believer. And the rich guy who ate the best food, dressed in the best clothes, all the rest of it, he says, you had all these good things. Lazarus didn't go to paradise because God felt sorry for him. He was a reversionistic believer, reduced to being a bum, or, or whatever you want to call it. That's what he was reduced to. He never repented, got back with God, and got his act together like the prodigal. He carried this thing all the way to death. He died before the rich man. But he's in paradise, and, 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 and Abraham's talking across this gulf to this rich man. He says that Lazarus is being comforted. He's not in this perfect place. Oh, how could you be such a... It doesn't work that way. A bad believer goes to heaven, they aren't raked over the coals. The only coals they're raked over is a bad experience at the Bema seat. A one-shot deal when they have great shame and then we move on. No rubbing it in after the fact. My STA tells me, when you see some of these people that bailed out of here, walk up to them and say, genius, I'm not going to do that. I won't have to. They'll already know. You're so damn smart. Well, you weren't. Their shame will come at the judgment seat of Christ. And for the rest of us, if we fail, if we fail the grace of God in the time, the short, short time we have left to us. Yeah, that's my STA it wants to say. Genius. Hey, look at the shape of the earth while you're at it. Missed that one? But that's being arrogant because I, I missed it for a long time. And I'm, so I'm humble about it. I learned it. Concerning sin, because they do not believe in me, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me. And concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. God's already judged him and assigned his, his end. That's Satan. He's already been defeated. Let me put it this way. Not tactically. He's still running amok. Strategically. Strategically, the de what broke the devil's back as far as any attempt to, 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 to win in his... And that's what Satanists are about. They don't... Satanists are not 
as I understand it. Satanists are not a bunch of atheists. Atheists are atheists. They may have ideas that atheists embrace, like evolution, but they are not atheists. They believe in Satan, and they believe there is a war between God and Satan, and, they're, and, they're, and they've been deluded into thinking they're going to win. That's a hardcore Satanist. The creator God is a bad God. That's in their quotes. The people at the Tower of Babel weren't atheists in the sense of they did not believe in the existence of a living God. They rebelled against him and wanted to build a tower and assault the throne room. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. That's what they wanted to do. And that same spirit is in the world today with these people in top places. Those that are, those that are Satanists. It seems like the population of the world is gaining more and more adherence and Satanists jumping on board of this thing. I mean, from the low rank people on up the ladder. I saw a deal of a young woman who was young, attractive, and had talent, singing talent. And she gave her statement that they wanted to put me into an initiation. And that was going to be my ticket to the top. She told him, no, I'm not doing it. When, Je when Jesus is offered the kingdoms of the world by Satan, if he just fall down and worship him, that same offer has been given to individuals. And they've, they've bitten, they've, they've jumped on it. The road to fame and wealth. I'm not saying everybody that's in a high position did that. I'm just saying that this, this does occur more than you and I might think. There's a book written by a, by a, a scholar, an Englishman, back in the 1800s. I forgot his name offhand. Robinson, R-O-B-I-N-S-O-N. That's his first last name. He was a, he, 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 you know, Oxford, one of those big Cambridge, I don't know which one. I mean, a scholar and everything. He says, I was, rec I was recruited by what we call the dark side. I was recruited because I was so articulate and had all this intellectual that I could really put this down. And he wrote a book, Proofs of a Conspiracy. The Conspiracy Against God and Man. And we're up to it in this world, up to our ears. And we're seeing the fruit and how it's coming out. Just follow the Satan deal. What's he want? Whatever God set up, he wants, to, he wants to flip the script. If marriage is good, now all this other junk is okay. And marriage is, uh. Nationalism. Oh, this is a very evil song. And it was very popular on the charts. It's, it's pure communist. By the way, the communists, like Stalin and Lenin and them, behind the scenes, they were Satanists. They might have said they're atheists, but they're Satanists. But this song, you, will, you might hear it redone. It's the John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine there's no more religion. Imagine there's no more property. Imagine there's no more nations. Oh, really? We're all equal and just happy as we can be. That's this song put out in a kind of sugar-coated way. Completely demonic. The whole thing. I didn't say they weren't talented. So what? They were madly popular in their day and little girls were screaming their heads off. These four guys from England. <clears throat> we have been given, we have five, we've been given the Holy Spirit 
to lead us into all truth. May I underline all truth. As someone said, oh, I can fellowship with them as long as they have the gospel, right? That's all. And they're a comfort. A comfort. Well, I want more than that. Yeah, I want the gospel, right? And I want to be around people that are an encouragement. Some believers aren't. By their attendance and their good attitude and their applications. That's a comfort. And things they say to me as in passing. That's a comfort. But I want more than that. I want the realm of doctrine insofar as we have, we have been working on it all these years. I'm not one of these that sits back and says, well, I don't care if the pastor doesn't teach through Genesis or any other book. Really? How does that square with the Bible? Don't listen to these people that naysay the importance of Bible doctrine verse by verse and doctrine by doctrine. If what blows my mind is that you can be here it for years and walk away from it. For the pablum, for the watered down. Well, they got this right. Was that all I have to do is have that right? It isn't good enough. It's enough of a challenge to do it right than it is to say, well, this is watered down. That's why we have the lukewarm church. The lukewarm church will not endure sound doctrine and a pastor up here with authority teaching them Bible doctrine. He's got to pander to them in the name of God. He's got to have an Easter service and a Christmas service. No, really, he does. He can't just say, that's a bunch of junk. How long do you think that'd last for him? Stand up there and say, don't lie to your little kids about a rotund man with gray hair and a red suit that's supposed to be up in the Arctic. It's a myth. Every good and, every good and wonderful gift comes down from the Father of lights. And don't come to me ever and say, well, it's just fun. The ancient pagan kids had fun dancing around, doing all their stuff. Satan realized, well, I can't sell them paganism like I used to, so I will do. We'll, we'll, we'll mix it with Christianity. And see how they like that. The early Protestants would have nothing to do with the typical holiday. They didn't. But they finally gave in. Because it started with the Catholics. Again, holiday comes and holiday goes. You can go out and eat and have fun. You don't have to vibrate because and you give someone a gift. But I don't even know what Merry Christmas means. I don't even think they do. Does that mean just have a good time, Jack? Did you have a good time? But I didn't have to do it wait to the 25th. What's the word Christmas mean? Christ's Mass, Catholic. It's like Happy Easter, Happy Ishtar, Goddess of Love. Don't believe me, look in Webster's Dictionary. The derivation of the word Easter. It comes from the Babylonian sex goddess, Ishtar. Okay. So we'll mix bunny rabbits, eggs, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ and have a good old day. Both of which, my grandson said, some teacher at school, his school, that this was a year or two ago, said that some teacher girl says, oh, oh, well, what's, about, what's the deal with uh, rabbits and chicken eggs? She says, oh, it's just about life. Well, if she's a Christian, and I doubt she probably is, that's not a good witness. That's not a good witness. We're to bear witness to the truth. As the cashier said to me, Happy Easter. I says, what's Easter mean? She says, oh, it means Passover. No, it doesn't. Not in a million miles. 
Jewish Passover has nothing to do with that. Because the word occurs, Easter, one time in the King James Version, because whoever translated Acts had an axe to sharpen and threw in their little Easter deal. We have the Holy Spirit to lead us in the truth, but when he, the Spirit, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will speak, for he will not speak on his own initiative. See, there, there again is that chain of command that's hard maybe to understand because they're co-equal and they're co-eternal. They're all equally veracity. They're all equally righteousness, all e blah, blah, blah. But there is a pecking order with regard to their function. You could have a business with three men running the business. They're all equally wealthy, they're all equal, but they each have a different assignment. Best one I can illustrate offhand. But whatever he hears, he will speak and will, and will disclose to you what is to come. Bible prophecy. The things necessary to be led by the Spirit. Positive volition. Doctrine in the human spirit. Isolation of the sin nature. An example of being led by the Holy Spirit an example of being led by the Holy Spirit, value, validating our status as sons of God, is overcoming fear. We have not been put into something where we need to be enslaved to the fear factor. We've been liberated. So with doctrine in the soul, you could potentially face any situation and do it without being under fear worry, anxiety, and things like that. The Spirit does not generate us and get us into fear, uh, except for fear of God, which is, which is fine. And fear of God doesn't mean some cowering deal. It means respect. We fear God, not men, not people. So he has not given us a spirit of fear. And you will get to apply this, and you won't be perfect, but understand fear is a sin. Well, everybody, and God the Holy Spirit does not lead us into bondage to this manifestation of the sin nature. 2 Timothy 1, 7. As an Here's the believer on top of things spiritually. The positive believer that knows their ground can't be intimidated. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity. That could be translated, God has not given us a spirit of cowardice. But of power and love and discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Okay? So fear is not to be a part of the believer's life. You're going to hear bad things, threatening things. Fear-mongering is what they're doing in our world today to scare us into the new world order. Get us to jump through all their hoops. Fear. There's so many scriptures that talk about avoiding fear. Ex good examples of believers in dicey situations that didn't cave into fear. Because when you cave into fear, you're miserable. It doesn't change anything. And you make some false moves. So we're not to worry. We're not to fret. Some people take pills because of this. Some people are so miserable that the least little thing drives them crazy. You're going to hear all kinds of dire reports and everything. How, how much truth is in all of them? Who knows? We're not to fear. 
We're to serve God and avoid this bondage. The verb again refers to the time before our salvation. Fear was always at least in the background. To live under fear is a form of enslavement, as is any ST activity. What is the universal fear that unbelievers live under? Fear of death, the unknown, what's beyond this life, nothing or something bad. Because they've heard some kind of description of the underworld, the afterlife, hell, whatever you want to call it. Fear of death, according to Hebrews 2.15. And might free those who through fear of death were subject to slavery all their lives. Always out there. They say people can't go through a single day without at least once thinking about their death. I do. My end I want it to be the rapture, but that's God's call. Okay? So that, they can dismiss it. They can put on a cavalier front. I'm not afraid to die. Bravado. But there's something there that nags. The unknown. The potentially what comes next, if anything. So fear of death. We're liberated from that. If you're going to fear something, fear that you fall short of God. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. That's sanctified fear. What's salvation? It's not phase one, it's phase two. There's two salvations. There's the one that keeps us out of hell, and the other one keeps us out of shame and loss at the Bama seat to the point that we can't celebrate. Thank you, Father, for the time together. May God, the Holy Spirit, continue to be with us, guide us, and direct us as a local church as we approach the end. In Jesus' name, amen.